Now, what was the great explorer Scott of the Antarctic, properly known as Captain Robert Falcon Scott, what was he doing when he wasn't going to the ends of the Earth exploring our polar regions? Well, one answer to that is that he was doing his duty as a serving naval officer. And at one particular point, he was looking up at the Rock of Gibraltar and getting bored. And this is told in vivid detail in letters that he wrote and which have come to, to light and are about to be auctioned at Dawson's Auctioneers. Peter Mason is an auctioneer from that auction house and he's joined us now. Hello, Peter. Good afternoon, John. Tell us then about Captain Scott's letters. They give us an insight into the the thinking, a bit of an insight into the thinking of this great historic British hero as he did his duty in uniform between polar expeditions. Yes, certainly. It's a fascinating discovery, really, just to have these letters because they date his first to the um, um, Antarctic and and then come back in between the two of them. So, if you like, there's there's about a six-year gap where he's... Previously, he's talking about his career and his development. Then he goes off, has this great adventure, and he comes back, and, and he all of a sudden finds himself back doing what he was doing before, so hanging around, waiting to be relieved. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful human insight into this great historic character, but it's not going to be much reproduced, is it, by the tourist office of Gibraltar? No, that's not, no. He's particularly scathing, I think, in a couple of uh, points. These are in um, both in letters to his mother. He just says that it's dreadfully hot, the rock looks yellow, and is altogether a depressing place. So I imagine if you live in Gibraltar now, you probably have a slightly different view of it, but uh, that was going through his head at the yeah. time, which is a bit... Uh, you wouldn't put that on a poster, on a tourist poster? Would you, if you were... Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't personally, no. But given who who was written it, you know, who am I to argue with him? No, no, quite. This is, this is, it, <laughs> it's, it's a fine historical document. Now, the letters, they also tell us more about Scott because they, they pay such warm tribute to him from and, and from some pretty illustrious figures, including J.M. Barry, the author of, of Peter Pan. Just tell us about those. That's true, yeah. I mean, it's part of this collection is, is a um, small book of uh, condolence letters and telegrams that his mother received following his death. I mean, bizarrely, it's about a year after he actually dies that the British public actually found out about it. And that's when these letters date from. So it's almost exactly a year later. Yeah. Um, but there's letters from Buckingham Palace. There's letters from J.M. Barry, as you say. There's someone called uh, Sir Clement Markham. He was quite an influential figure in the Navy in, in um, Queen Victoria's time. And he was still kind of hanging around. And he was a champion of Scott. And he writes a particularly poignant, um, heartfelt message to Captain Scott's mother. Yeah. Just, you know, saying how much he missed him, what a hero he was. And, and how kind he was. A, you know, a bit of a glimpse of Captain Scott's character, just an extraordinary level of personal kindness. Well, that's it. And a bit unusual is that a bit later in the 20th century, Scott's character and his kindness and his abilities were kind of denigrated, if you like, by various authors who wrote um, biographies of him. So it's interesting to actually go back to the time and see the depth of feeling that was actually there at that time, rather than 50 years later when someone had a bit more time to think about it. Yeah, and, and when I say a great British hero, a great British figure, then that's precisely true, isn't it? I, I recall as a, as a boy being told the story of Scott of the Antarctic and that final expedition, Captain Oates, and that that scene at the at the the tent, you know, s- surrounded by absolutely nothing. Oates leaves the tent and says, "I'm I'm going out. I'm I'll be some time." And everyone knows yes. that Captain Oates is not coming back. It's just a a great story of personal bravery. Yeah, it is. Yes, and that's uh, what's interesting is a bit later on with these biographies and the kind of running down of Scott. There was a certain suggestion that potentially J. M. Barry had um, doctored, for want of a better word, the diaries of Scott, which were quite kind of matter of fact. But him being a talented author, he kind of dressed them up a little bit. And so mm-hmm. there is some debate about whether that's exactly what Captain Oates said or whether yeah. that's what J. M. Barry thought he might have said. So, oh, oh, really, yeah. that that legendary story could all be fake, fake news. Well, it could be. It could be. It's still to be discovered, I guess. Well, I guess. Well, that's an intriguing question, Mark. But but anyway, at the time. This man was a national hero, such a national hero, oh, yes, wasn't he? I mean, the, the, the evening news at the time, they suggested that schools up and down the country should read the story of Captain Scott's life and death in every school on the day yes. that he was being commemorated at St Paul's Cathedral. Yes, he was a hero. Again, it comes back to later readings, kind of suggested that perhaps he wasn't such a hero because he failed. He didn't do the uh, competition to get to the South Pole. Mm. And, you know, ultimately he paid with his own life and the life of his men. Taps into that uh, British uh, love of an underdog, if you like. Oh, I always thought the think. fact that he that he may have been beaten by that rival expedition added to the heroism of it all. It was the it was the effort that he put in and the sacrifice that was made, or maybe that's I don't know too romantic an idea. Yeah, I mean it's it's a whole fascinating subject. Now I had a good general schoolboy knowledge like anyone else of his career and his death and all that kind of thing. But but what's been fascinating is reading a bit more detail into it and also 
subsequent thoughts about it and then even modern day thoughts where there's a bit of a reversal heading back to actually you know he was just a bit unlucky things with the weather and things like that might have actually brought a different result unfortunately Peter what will the letters make at auction do you think and who, who do you reckon's going to buy them first question um, they're estimated at eight to ten thousand um, I'll be honest it's a bit of a speculative estimate because we just don't know these letters with this amount of detail coupled with the condolence letters to the family it haven't been seen before obviously so, no. so, are, you, are, we, are we looking at a private collector do you think or maybe a, I think a museum it might be a private collector yes and obviously with online bidding all over the world there could be interest from the states i think probably even new zealand who played a heavy role in the uh, trips to the antarctic so uh, yes we're hoping for you know lots of interest worldwide but I, it's a bit difficult to say who's going to buy them but i'm sure they'll you know find a good home Well, let's hope they do. Peter Mason, thanks for joining us. That's Peter Mason from Dawson's Auctioneer, who's going to be auctioning Captain Scott's letters before the end of the month.